दुर्गमया मृत्युर्मा अमृत गमय ओ शाति 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 ओ लीड अस फ्रॉम द अनरियल टू द रियल लीड अस फ्रॉम डार्कनेस अन टू लाइट लीड अस फ्रॉम डेथ टू इमोटैलिटी Om peace 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 Good morning and we are back again Yesterday I was speaking about the Mandukya Upanishad the talk was on awaken from waking and now we understand why that that title has been given awaken from waking because we have three states waking dreaming and deep sleep and we normally think that the waking is the most awake we can get waking plus a cup of coffee is more awake but <laughs> waking plus mandukya upanishad is really awakening so that is uh, awakening from waking now that's what the mandukya upanishad is about but i told you only half of it saving cleverly saving the other half for today's lecture the upanishad the, it's a very small upanishad but half of it is about waking dreaming and deep sleep and the fourth the witness consciousness of waking dreaming and deep sleep only half of it is about that the other half of it is about om we always use om while chanting it is the single most holiest uh, syllable or word in all of hinduism in fact all the religions of the east hinduism buddhism jainism sikhism uh, om is is universally revered in all of these uh, religions all of these traditions and from very ancient times from the vedas themselves in sikhism the most modern of the indian religions which dates back over 600 years where the highest reality is called om ek omkar one om is is the highest reality now om of course as you might imagine has been interpreted in many many ways in different traditions so some say om stands for the trimurti the brahma vishnu maheshwara the god god as creator god as preserver god as the, as the and uh, uh, ultimate destroyer of the universe come come on in is there a chair here, here. yes there one here there's one right there yeah where are you but the most profound interpretation of om and the understanding of om is found in the mandukya upanishad the deepest why is om discussed in the mandukya mandukya upanishad with well, mandukya upanishad does not waste words it's really really tiny mm-hmm. having told us about turiya the fourth the real aspect of ourselves which we have to realize as ourselves once you realize that you are enlightened you are beyond suffering but yeah the mandukya upanishad spoke about waking dreaming and deep sleep and the consciousness one consciousness in which they all appear and that is what we are now the question arises is this sufficient if you get it is it in, enough to make you enlightened the answer is both yes and no if you understand it that is the foundation for enlightenment but that itself is not equal to enlightenment because you might very well understand it and still say wait a minute you advertise that if i if i'm enlightened i'll be i'll transcend all suffering and i'll get this ultimate bliss or whatever you're talking about um but that's not happening but i've got a fair understanding of what you're talking about so this understanding while essential on this remember we are on the path of knowledge this is this is gyana yoga so understanding while essential on the path of knowledge is not sufficient what is sufficient this must deepen into realization this deepening into realization first of all intellectual understanding uh, conviction and that deepens into realization what is realization then it becomes a living fact just like i feel i am swami sarvapriyananda i am this person i don't it's not an understanding it's it's the basic fact of my life that's what we feel when we uh, in our enla- unenlightened state exactly with that kind of confidence with that kind of clarity even more so when you feel that when you know and you feel and you recognize that you are this unchanging immortal consciousness 
in which waking, dreaming and deep sleep rotate daily. The universe appears and disappears every day within you, that, that consciousness. When you, when you feel that, when you actually see that, that is realization. Then you can actually claim that you are beyond sorrow and suffering. How do you make that happen? For that, the Mandukya prescribes a practice. So many people sit up at this point, ah, that's what I wanted. You should have led with that. <laughs> what do I actually do? What do I have to do with all this abstract uh, philosophy? Give me something to do. But unfortunately, this doing will not work unless you understand it. Once you get it, this, this practice is just a way of deepening the understanding. If the understanding is not there, the practice will be a nice practice. You'll feel a little calm after it, that's all. You are very far from enlightenment. So what is this practice? It takes the holy word Om and um, analyzes it. It goes like this. It, it's a method of meditation which will enable us to deepen our understanding of the Turiya, the fourth. Now what, what does it do? It tells us, look at Om. Om has four letters in it, or four sounds in it. In Sanskrit, Chatur Matra, four, four letters. Actually, three letters followed by silence. So what are the three letters? In English, when you write it, you write it as A-U-M. Um, so, Aum, but don't pronounce it as Aum. <laughs> That's a wrong pronunciation. Sometimes a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Without knowing it, when you read it, O-M, and you pronounce it Om, you are actually doing it right. When you say, analyze it further into A, U and M, they ah, I didn't know that. So I must pronounce it as Aum. No, don't do that. That's wrong. Why? By the rules of... Um, uh, do you have a place to sit? Yeah. By the rules of Sanskrit grammar, when you have A and U together, one after another, they join together, it's called a, a conjunction, sandhi, and it becomes O. So, A and U together becomes O. And so, when you pronounce it, it's not Aum, but it's Om. The O includes the A and the U. The O includes the A and the U. They are hidden, they are, they are merged in there, in the sound O. Also, it is not A, U and M. The original Sanskrit is A, U and M. Mm. So the closest approximation we get in, in English is A, U and M. But happily, when you put it together as O, M, the, the sound is correct. That's what it's supposed to sound like, O, M. So, A, U, M. Three letters. When you complete it, it becomes O, M. Followed by silence. That's the fourth. Now, if you treat Om like this, with four matra in San Sanskrit, four letters or four matra, immediately it strikes you, hey, wait a minute, didn't you say yesterday that the self, I, myself, have four aspects? Yes, you do. You have a waking aspect, the waker and the waker's universe. You have a dream aspect, the dreamer and the dream, dream world. You have a deep sleep aspect, the blankness of deep sleep. And the consciousness, the fourth, the consciousness in which all of this are, all of this is happening or appearing. Now, Om has four. Would it be a good idea to map them? Yes, Mandukya uh, says it. That, that's what I'm going to do. You have four letters in Om, three letters in one silence, and four aspects of the self. The Mandukya says, do this. Associate the letters with the aspects of the self. In Sanskrit, pada matra matrascha pada. Associate the letters and the and the uh, states. So, a, uh, just give it the name. Your entire waking world, this one, and you yourself, the body, the mind, the person, all of this, you give it the name. Associate in your mind strongly. This is, I'm calling it a. Uh. All this is a. Uh. That's, that's the name of I, the waker, and this waker's world. Ah. Go further. We fall asleep and dream. You are there in your dream and you experience a dream world. Just like, quite a lot like this waking world, only more fun. 
or more, more crazy, more Hollywood. <laughs> Call it U. Call it U. The A-U, the, the second one. Give it the name U. Give it the name U means associate it in your mind again and again. Um, U. And then, please find a place to sit down here. And then, the third one, deep sleep. The M that you find at the end, M. Mm, you take that and give it, give deep sleep the name M. Mm, M. Associate it strongly. Remember, you don't have to go into your dream world. You don't have to fall asleep. You shouldn't. For, for Jnana Yoga to work, you have to be awake and thinking. So it's all an exercise done in this waking state, remember. So using the powers of imagination, imagine your life, your waking life, that is a. Uh, imagine some dream or all dreams and call it ooh in your mind. And then deep sleep experience, call it mm. Now when you chant om, either loudly or softly or in your mind, preferably in the mind, when you chant it, first you chant it in a low tone, in a long om. It is called Dirgha Pranava Uchcharana. Pranava is the, the is Sanskrit term for Om. So a, a long stretched out Om. And as you go through the Om, this is something that has to be done. Bring to your mind the associations as you go through Om. So here, as you go through Om, you say, here I am. My This is the body and mind. This is for my history from childhood to teenage to youth to middle age and so on and this is the world I live in the, this is the situation of the world is the history of the, here is this earth and this universe and my society and community I live in to the whole idea I have about my waking world bring it to your mind this is my life this is ah uh. as it fades into ooh think about your dream world that I fall asleep and completely forget this world I completely forget it. I forget that I am on my bed and sleeping. I forget that also. My bedroom and I am sleeping on my bed. All of that is forgotten. And I inhabit a dream world. Entirely projected in the mind. Where I am also a part of that world. I am a person who has got happiness. Who has got misery. Who has fears and anxieties and desires in that world. I move around. I think they are different people. I think they are different objects. Places to visit. Things which will happen. All of that is ooh. That's my second aspect of my experience of myself. And then it merges in deep sleep. I do not see any external world. I do not dream any dreams. I am not even aware of myself in deep sleep. If you are aware that I am in deep sleep, then you are not in deep sleep. <laughs> there is this funny story. Uh, uh, actually... It's very difficult to put little children to bed, you know, when they, especially bedtime, they become more active. So, um, sometimes what mothers do is, uh, is the nice little boy asleep? If he is, if he's really asleep, then his left toe will wiggle. And the left, left toe wiggles, you know that the kid is not asleep. <laughs> uh, not that it's relevant. I remember... We were in the Deoga Ramakrishna Mission. It's a school for little boys. And th there are hostels, dormitories in which the boys live. And uh, there are these uh, monks who were in charge. Some of the monks were strict. There was one monk who was very uh, soft and grandfatherly, very grandfatherly old man. And he had, he had all the trouble. Because the, the kids were 10-year-olds, you know, full of energy and all. So to make them go to sleep at night, there's, there's a strict rule. At 10.30, the lights are switched off and you have to go to sleep at 10, 10 o'clock. So there was this other monk who was in charge of another dorm uh, in the next building who was very strict. And uh, his, his hostel, it was very disciplined. So this old Swami goes to the other monk and says, How do you make those boys fall asleep? And he says, I am very strict. I don't take any nonsense. I, I say, I, I'm going to count to three. And I want you all uh, in your beds, under your, uh, you know, uh, bed sheets, in your, uh, 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 under your blankets, and asleep, or at least eyes closed, and no movement. So I'm going to count to one, two, three, and it's silence after that. I won't take any nonsense. And it works. He said, "Yes, it works." And this old Swami said, "Let me try it out." 
<laughs> Next day in the morning, so we are all eager. What happened, Swami? Did it work? So no. I told them I'm going to count to one, two, three, and by three you should all be quiet and asleep in your in your beds. So I said one and two, and the boys in chorus they shouted back three. <laughs> So I guess it doesn't depend on the system. It depends on the person. <laughs> so deep sleep, my deep sleep world, absolute blankness. I do not experience an external world. I do not experience a dream world. I do not even experience myself as sleeping. The subject and the object are merged in, uh, uh, in an undifferentiated blankness. And yet it is an experience. As I said, deep sleep is not an absence of experience. It is the experience of absence. I have said this earlier also. Once and there was a very interesting conference on con uh, consciousness in the Institute of Culture in Calcutta, in Gold Park. So there were scientists, neuroscientists, psychologists, uh, philosophers. And they could not arrive at a definition. They still haven't arrived on a definition of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the question came down to deep sleep. And a philosopher of Sankhya, Professor Gerald Larson, was in the United States, he was there. He asked a question to the neuroscientist. He said, Doctor, in deep sleep, according to modern neuroscience, in deep sleep, is there consciousness? And the doctor said, no. As we understand it and define it, there is no consciousness in deep sleep. It's an unconscious state. And the Sankhya philosopher said, well, here is the difference between um, uh, Indian philosophy and um, modern neuroscience. According to Sankhya, or according to Indian philosophy, in deep sleep, there is only consciousness. <laughs> you see, from your, completely from your subjective point of view, you're looking at it from your own point of view. From your own point of view in the waking state, here is this world. From your own point of view in the dream state, here is this dream world. And from your own point of view in deep sleep state, what is there? Nothing. But you have your point of view there. You don't think at that point because mind is also not working. You don't obviously see or smell or touch anything in that world. So external world, dream world, not, none of them are there. But yet, you do wake up and say that there was such an experience of absence. In every culture you come across this term. I slept like a log. I slept deeply. I didn't know anything. That means I did not even dream. So that I had an experience of sleep without dreaming. That is an experience, not an inference. Somebody says that, no, don't we infer it after waking up? There was dreams and there was a period of no dreaming, so I infer it. Inference means looking at data and making a connection back again. Do you actually wake up and then you look at your clock? Okay, there was 30 minutes of dreaming, then there's a two hours unaccounted for. That must be deep sleep. Do you do that in the morning and asleep audit? No. You straight away feel, I dreamt and there were periods of nothingness. There were periods of nothingness. How do you know that unless it's a kind of experience? Just because the mind is not working there, we don't take it as experience because we are used to experiencing things through the mind. So deep sleep is... Mm. As you do this, uh, it will actually happen. You can, we'll try it just a little bit for a couple of minutes. You will actually begin to get the intuition that you are not trapped within those states. Those states appear, play around and disappear in you, the witnessing awareness. You will get the intuition of an awareness that you being something apart from them. That silence into which Om disappears. Associate that silence with the Turiya, the fourth, the pure consciousness, existence consciousness, please, with yourself. Right now, what is associated with yourself? Aum. What Upanishad wants you to do, what Mandukya wants you to do is that your real name is that silence. After a uh, u mm. Now remember one thing, that silence is not the silence opposed to noise. There is a silence opposed to noise. It's silent, no noise, very peaceful. Moment there is noise, will you say there is silence? No, the silence is gone, it's noisy now. So that silence has a beginning and an end. If there is no noise, there is silence. If there is silence, there is no, no, there is no uh, If there is noise, there is no silence. So that way. But this silence which the Upanishad speaks about is a silence which you find at the end of Om, 
but also the silence underlying Om. It's something that seems to get hidden, covered by the presence of Om, <laughs> uh, um, but it's there. What is precisely meant by silence in Om, this, this, this is the most important point. This is what you have to look out for. As Om fades into silence, you are the witness of that silence. So the silence after Om means the witness, means the witness consciousness. I'll repeat that any number of times. The silence after Om is not just an absence of noise. It's you, the consciousness, who experiences the silence. It's silence permeated by the light of consciousness. It is silence permeated by the light of consciousness. It is you, the consciousness, who you, you experience, see, within quotes, that silence. Or hear that silence. Let's try it. I'll um, chant Om. Um, <coughs> three times you chant with me. Then three times I will chant again. You don't chant. Just listen to the Om and bring, bring vividly to your mind waking, dreaming, deep sleep and the witness of the three in the silence. When there is Om, it begins... Bring to your mind a, w- a waking state. When, the, when it fades into ooh, bring to your mind your dreams. It doesn't have to be any particular dream, anything. Just the concept of dreaming. And when it fa- fades into the, the final mmm, bring to the, your mind the absolute stillness and darkness of deep sleep. Nothing. That's also an experience. When it fades into silence, don't, don't give up, don't stop there. When it fades into silence, drop, consciously drop all three. Drop the, <laughs> drop the nothingness of deep sleep also. Drop the nothingness of deep sleep also at that point. You can say, what, what can you do? What will be there if you drop nothingness? It cannot be expressed in language. You will see. What will remain is you, the observer of that nothingness. And that is the silence. Then again, Om will begin. Bring back the waking, dreaming and deep sleep again. So let's three times with me. Three times, just do it by yourself. I'll chant, listen to the chant and do it. And then I will ask you to open your eyes. So relax. If you feel like, you can close your eyes. Now with me. As I will chant Om, vividly imagine your life, waking life. Vividly imagine what it is like to dream. Vividly imagine what it is like to be absolutely in the darkness of deep sleep. And then with one quick effort, drop that darkness also. In that silence, you are that light.
When you are comfortable, you can slowly open your eyes. Don't look up immediately. You can look at your lap for a while and then slowly look up. You'll get the hang of it. <laughs> Now, there is one thing that I should mention because I have titled this talk The Secret of Om. I really have not come to the secret of Om yet. <laughs> this, what I reveal to you, is just the preliminary practice. <coughs> the real thing, I will talk about it. It's really deep and difficult. But if you get it, it's not very complex, it's very simple. But simple things are often difficult. It just makes, Om just makes the universe disappear like that. How? This relates to the question that you asked, Ajatavada, non-origination of the universe. It goes like this. It's a um, rather densely argued thing. Understand the arguments, listen very carefully, understand the arguments, and then try to see it in the world as, as yes, this is what it is. All right, here it here goes. Take the example of a golden bracelet. Yesterday I gave you the example of gold, which comes as a bracelet, as a necklace, and as a ring. And it, what, did it, what did I want to show by that? That you, like gold, you are the consciousness, which is experienced as waker and waking, that's like the bracelet, as the dreamer and dreaming, like the necklace, as the deep sleeper and deep sleep, as the ring. But you are always the unchanging consciousness in all of them. All the changes are experienced within you. They are not anything apart from you. Okay, so this was the example. Now, take that example itself. Take one ornament. Say something like the, like the bracelet. A golden bracelet. Go, bracelet made of gold. Now, Om. See, here we are entering into a little bit of the philosophy of language. Language is used to refer to things. So words, language is made of words, words refer to things. So I have a word, microphone, it refers to this thing. So each word refers to something. And the collection of all these words is our language and the rules of usage and everything. And the things, the collection of all things is the universe. So language and the universe, they map very well. This is a very... Um, basic idea of language. Modern philosophers of language have thought very deeply about it. Wittgenstein, for example. He said at one point in this Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, he said that um, um, the limits of, the, of my language are the limits of the world. You can say, what does it mean? I'm sorry, I can't help you because Wittgenstein was not one for explaining what he meant. <laughs> So if you see the original book, Fractatus, you will see it's 1, 1 1.1, 1.2, 1 1.3, just short sentences, like almost aphoristic. And the introduction is no more helpful. In the introduction he says, what I have, the thoughts that I have set down in, this, in, this, in the pages to follow, they will make sense to somebody who has already understood what I am trying to say. And then he says, as for the rest, I do not care. <laughs> Not the makings of a bestseller, you would say, but, but it became a bestseller. At least people are endlessly fascinated by those little sayings. So one of the sayings is, at the very end, end of, almost towards the end of the book, very Vedantic saying. Um, when he talked about the limits of the world or the limits of language, and then he says, what is beyond the universe is beyond language, we must 
we, we must pass over it in silence. So, I mean, I don't know if you knew much Vedanta. He had been, in Vienna, he had been exposed to some of the thoughts of Tagore. There was, uh, there was some of the philosophers were influenced by Rabindranath Tagore, so they had discussions in the Vienna circle. So I guess some of that, and he might have read something, I don't know. But anyway, he, he could have just as well come up, come up, up uh, upon it by himself. He was an extraordinarily brilliant man, and, um, uh, a brilliant mystic, I would say. He was very mystical in one sense. Um, anyway, so here we have language, the collection of all words. Here we have the universe, the collection of all objects, and words refer to objects. Now let's look at the object, the bangle. The, the bracelet, the golden bracelet. <coughs> when you examine the bracelet, uh, you find that um, it is made of gold. So gold is the gold is the material cause, what is called the material cause, and bangle is the effect. Gold is the material cause, and bangle is the effect. Now we have two. We have two words. Follow this carefully. We have two words. What are the two words? I'm using bangle bracelet, uh, so let's say, let's call it a bracelet. We have two words, Br <coughs> bracelet and gold. When you examine the bracelet, you find it is made of gold. What you are touching is gold, inside is gold, outside is gold. The whole thing is made of gold, through and through it is gold. We find that, right? What you weigh is the gold, right? Now, in that case, we find no, no object called bracelet. Follow this carefully. Where is the thing called a bracelet? The thing seems to be gold only. You will say, no, it is a particular form, gold given a form, that is called a bracelet. But is the form a thing apart from the, uh, from the gold itself? If you remove the gold, will the form remain in a ghostly way? What is that? The smile of the Cheshire cat or something? Yeah. Yeah. When the cat goes away, will the smile still be the hanging there? Uh, that book is very philosophical. Alice in Wonderland. If you take the gold away, will the form of the bracelet still be there? Will anything of the bracelet remain if you take the gold away? If you melt it down to gold, and what will remain of the bracelet? Nothing. In fact, we very soon see that the bracelet is through and through gold. There is no thing, no substance called a bracelet. Now let me ask, what does the word bracelet refer to? When I say microphone, microphone is a word, it refers to this thing. Now here is a bracelet. Show me what, what the word bracelet refers to. You'll say, why? You are holding it. But I say, I'm holding gold. I'm holding gold. Show me apart from the gold, where is this bracelet? There is no object corresponding to bracelet, to the word bracelet. It's a word without any corresponding object. Moment you see it from the perspective of gold. Let me repeat. The moment you see it from the perspective of gold, the word bracelet now no longer refers to anything. The thing is gold now. Are you with me so far? Mm -hmm then the word bracelet has lost its referent. And the word bracelet fades into silence. Mm -hmm. it, is not, it has nothing to refer to. At this point you may say, no, no, there is a name bracelet and it is a form, it is a particular function. Yes, but all of those are dependent on the substance called gold. Apart from the gold, there is no such thing as bracelet. How would that work? For example, if I say uh, microphone and paper. Microphone I can show you separately. This is the word microphone, here is the object microphone. Paper I can show you separately. Here is the word paper and here is the object paper. But can you do the same thing for a gold bracelet? You cannot do that. If you sh show the gold separately, you cannot show the bracelet separately. So the word bracelet has no thing which it refers to. And so the word, word itself disappears into silence. It is negated. In Sanskrit, the terms are very precise. Pada, padartha, nisheda. Padartha means object. When the object itself disappears, the name is left without a support. The word does not refer to anything anymore. Object disappears means the bracelet has disappeared, not totally. It's disappeared into gold. 
I mean, it's 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 a gold. We recognize it as gold. If you are with me so far, then I say that the word, the 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 object bracelet has is nothing but a word. This is the uh, understanding from Chandogya Upanishad actually. Now apply it here for Om. What happens? You see, the entire waking world, this entire waking world which you are experiencing, you the waker and your waking world is nothing apart from the underlying consciousness, the Turiya. Every bit of it is the Turiya itself, consciousness itself, with names and forms. Name, form and function in Sanskrit, Nama, Rupa, Vyavahara, you call it men, women, trees, plants, oceans, skies, planets, protons, things like that. They are all name and form. Yesterday I was mentioning structure. According to Aristotle, reality is composed of stuff and structure. In um, Greek, uh, highly and morph. Uh, so, but the scientists are saying now, if that is true, they're crit criticizing this idea. If that is true, then the more we investigate, where is the stuff? All we are finding is structure. Mostly it's structure. An atom, for example, uh, is uh, there is a tiny um, nucleus and far-flung electrons. Somebody gave a beautiful example yesterday that, uh, you know what it's like, an atom? It seems to be like a little billiard ball, but it, nothing could be further from the truth. There's a, there's, it's like, imagine a baseball stadium with a basketball in the center of the stadium and, and a baseball at the furthest seat at the, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the stadium. That's the electron and this is the nucleus and the rest is empty space. We are finding more and more, and even those things, even those electrons, they are not like little billiard balls. We would, that's how we have been taught in schools, you know. They are more like uh, bundles of uh, electrical charges uh, with particular behaviors, you know, spins and things like that. So what the scientist says, we are finding more and more structure. Where is the substance itself? This is called the negation of the object. The moment the object is negated, the name is also negated. Because the name does not refer to anything. Now the waking world, we called it A. Uh, remember? Om, A, U, M. We call this entire waking experience A. Uh. And yet, this entire waking experience, I, the waker, and all the things that I experience in the waking world, all of them, if they are nothing apart from consciousness, then all the names, the individual names, Sarva Priyananda, Swami, um, Mr. So-and-so, uh, Miss So-and-so, and so on, um, San Diego and California and uh, United States and Pacific Ocean, all these names, what do they actually refer to? They all do not refer to the individual objects because individual objects and entities are nothing apart from the consciousness underlying them. So because the individual entities have no independent existence apart from the consciousness, the names do not refer to anything real. Because the only reality here is consciousness. If this is difficult to wrap your mind around, imagine the dream sequence uh, uh, in your dreams. When you are there in your dreams and you meet so many people in your dreams and so many things keep happening in your dreams, you have so many names for them. Uh, these are my friends. These are my, I don't like these people. They are my enemies. These are the places I want to visit. These are plants and dogs and um, uh, the sky and so all the names which you use in the dream. If I say those names do not refer to anything real. It's only the mind, the dreamer's mind, which is everything there. Then those names do not refer to anything real in the dream. Correct? Those names have no more reference. They fall into silence. Exactly like that, in place of the mind, put Turiya, the consciousness, in which all of this is appearing. And all of this is non-distinct non from that Turiya. Like the bangle is non-distinct from, or bracelet is non-distinct from the constituent gold. Similarly, all of this is non-distinct from you, the consciousness. Then the name which you give to all of it, the thousands of names are all subsumed under ah, uh, And that's the name to give, given to your entire experience of waking. If the waking is nothing other than consciousness, Turiya, in that case, ah, uh, what does it refer to? It falls into silence. <laughs> Similarly, ooh, the dream. The name of the entire dream experience. If that entire dream experience really is nothing apart from consciousness, Turiya. Just as, just as 
the bracelet is nothing apart from the constituent gold. If this dream experience is nothing apart from you, the witnessing consciousness, then what does the word U, the letter U, refer to? Because the dream has no independent existence of its own. What is the thing which it refers to? Nothing. Because the thing in the dream, the reality is the consciousness. Then the U falls into silence. And the M mm at the end, the deep sleep, similarly, in the deep sleep state is nothing apart from the consciousness shining upon no object at all. Then that M mm also does not refer to anything real. That also falls into silence. As you reduce the waking, dreaming and deep sleep, as you see their non-difference from you, the fourth consciousness, then all the names OM also fades into silence. The names do not refer to any real thing. Therefore, the letters, they are reduced to silence and the silence refers to you, the pure consciousness. That is the deep inner secret of OM. You have to use a lot of philosophy of language there <laughs> to bring it to bear. This is something that is, uh, that is discussed in the um, Chandogya Upanishad and this idea is imported from there. This is the deep inner working of Om. Om reveals to you Brahma Satyam, Brahman is real. Why? That which is referred to by silence, that is the reality. Jagat Mithya, the world is an appearance. Why is the world an appearance? Because a, uh, u, uh, m mm, do not refer to anything real in itself. They all refer to the appearances of that Brahman as waking, dreaming and deep sleep. So a, uh, u uh, and m mm, are not really referring to anything other than appearances. So the world is an appearance. After all, what is the world? Your waking world, your dream world and your deep sleep. That's the world for you. The world is an appearance. Appearance of what? The underlying consciousness of you, the real you. And Jiva Brahmhevanapara. I'm summarizing the entire teaching of Vedanta. Jiva Brahmhevanapara means you, the individual sentient being, you are none other than the absolute, the Turiya. The whole thing is summarized by Om. Yeah. Vedanta, if you want to compress, if you want to see, if you really want to get the highest teaching of Vedanta, straightforward. The best teaching of Vedanta that is done in silence. In Dakshinamurti Stotra, there's a beautiful description of Shankaracharya. He gives a beautiful description of the enlightened master <laughs> teaching the students, the fit, the qualified students. He says the master is young, the students are old. Uh, very interesting description. Probably he's describing himself. He was 16 years old. And he was surrounded by students who were all older than himself. So... The master is young, they, they sit under a tree, a banyan tree. The master is a classic Indian scene. They sit under a banyan tree, the master is young, the disciples are old. The, the teaching is given in silence and the doubts of the disciples are dispelled. What a beautiful uh, description of... Uh, that's the highest teaching. The highest teaching is silence. What silence? The silence at the end of Om. That silence. That silence which is pregnant with consciousness. You the consciousness. You are the witness consciousness of that silence. Now silence by itself may not be a very effective teacher for most people. <laughs> I go to this great master and he sits and looks at me in silence. <laughs> there is this uh, story of a Zen, Zen student you know, who goes to a master and um, the master just doesn't tell anything, just you know, lives a very ordinary life and the student stays with him for a few days and is totally bored. Nothing is happening. And then he gets disgusted. So he says, okay, this is so-called best master and he is no good. It doesn't, he didn't help me. Let me look for the second best master. He, I think he must have looked it up. I don't know if they had Yelp on those days. <laughs> the second best master. So he goes to the second best master. And the second best master he sees to his, uh, to his happiness there are many more students there. So, okay, I should have come here. And that second best master, he makes them meditate. Sit in silence all day long. And uh, that also is a little difficult and dry for this guy. He says, look, this is fine, but you know, I'm not getting anything out of it. He looks it up, third best master. And the third best master, he goes, and he sees many more students there. He says, oh, this is great. And the third best master gives lots and lots of talks. And 
um, the, he quickly takes down notes and he has very soon volumes of notes and he one day expresses his joy to the third best master. Oh master, you are the greatest. People should come to you, explain everything so delightfully. I went to those guys, you know, the other guy would just sit in silence and the first guy is just nothing. He just doesn't do anything. <laughs> He's just quiet. And this third bit master says that, what a fool you are. <laughs> All this which I'm inadequately teaching to you, that you find in the meditation teacher's classes and that you find even better directly communicated in the silence of the first master. <laughs> in the Kano Upanishad you find after, it's, it's another small Upanishad, slightly bigger than the Mandukya. There, after the whole teaching is over, at the end of the Upanishad, the t student t says to the teacher, um, please teach me the Upanishad. And the teacher said, I have already taught you the Upanishad, you have not understood. Um, so silence is the best teaching, but it's not clear to one who is not prepared. Then the next best teaching in Upanishad is, the entire teaching of the Upanishad is summed up in Om. Silence. Next teaching is, next. You step down a little bit, Om. This is the entire teaching, as you can see now. The word Om, it includes the entire Mandukya Upanishad. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep and the Turiya beyond that. All of that is packed into Om. If you want further explanation, can you just give me a little more? Uh, then the next best teaching, step down further, is the Mahavakya, the great sentence, that thou art. Now, finally, we are beginning to use understandable words. That the Upanishad itself has one of the Mahavakyas. I am Atma Brahma. This very self is the Absolute. This very self. The, the teacher, the commentator there, Shankaracharya, he says in Sanskrit, he comments that as if by indicating with the fingers towards oneself, I am Atma means this very self is the Absolute. Correctly understood. If you want even further explanation, step down further. Then that thou art, what does the word that mean? What does the word thou mean? Then you have got, you have to read the whole Mandukya Upanishad and begin to get it. If you don't get it after that also, there's actually a story. Hanuman goes to Ramachandra. Hanuman goes to uh, um, Sri Rama and asks, um, how does a seeker after enlightenment, liberation, get liberation? And Rama replies to Hanuman, Mandukyam ekam evalam mumukshunam vimuktai. Mandukya Upanishad by itself is sufficient for the liberation of those who seek liberation. And then, suppose I don't get liberation, I have attended two talks and still am not enlightened. <laughs> and then Rama goes on to say, here is a list, he gives, actually gives a list, and you find this in Muktika Upanishad. You find a list of 108 Upanishads. <laughs> you read, uh, the, uh, so... You can get more and more detail, everything fleshed out in greater and greater detail, but all of it is summarized in the Mandukya. And all of Mandukya is summarized in the sentence, I am Atma Brahma, or that thou art in Mandukya, I am Atma Brahma, this very self is Brahma. That teaching is summarized in the single cell, um, word, Om. And that is also, uh, finally, it, it reduces to silence. So this vast literature, Upanishads and their commentaries and sub-commentaries and sub-sub-commentaries and multiple magnificent structures of philosophies built up on all of that. They all reduce to Om and especially the silence at the end of Om. Just one more thing and I'm done. Um, just for the sake of completion. The real thing is I've already said. You have to chew upon it, what I said. The highlights of this talk, uh, the secret of Om are two things. One is how you associate a, u, m with waking, dreaming and deep sleep and the silence with your reality, Turiya. The silence is what you have to dwell upon. Though you are the conscious witness of that silence at the end of Om. So that's the first thing to learn from the secret of Om. And the second thing is the philosophy of language which I showed you, how the words and their reference are negated. How the universe disappears into you, the pure consciousness, and Om disappears into silence. That's the second thing. Just as an add-on here, let me just, for the sake of completion, all these talks, yesterday and today, you might say, you never mentioned God. What about God? Mm. 
I did mention as part of Alan Watts story, I think. But anyway, in general, where is where does um, Mandukya talk about God? So what is the Advaita Vedanta take on God? It works like this. Again, back to the waking, dreaming and deep sleep paradigm. It, it's a very clear idea of God. See if it appeals to you. What is God? What are you in right now, in the waking state, in this present condition? According to Mandukya, Mandukya's view is that Turiya, that pure consciousness associated with one mind and one body there calls itself you. Here associated, that pure consciousness associated with one or limited by one mind and this body now is calling itself not Turiya but Sarva Priyananda. We call ourselves the waker. Each of us has a common name, the waker. Now imagine that one consciousness, suppose, just a mind game, imagine, that one consciousness were to be associated not with only one body and mind, but all of us, you and him and her and all of us, all of us, not only us, the plants and trees and the dogs and the cats and the dolphins and the killer whales and all of that out there, all living beings in the universe and why all living beings all other non-living entities from down from, from protons to quasars all of that if there was a consciousness which which could call it i imagine that would be what open the manduk upanishad calls god consciousness associated with the cosmos consciousness associated with one individual body mind the sentient being Jiva, you. Consciousness associated with the cosmos is God. Remember, we call this waking state the physical aspect of the self, the gross aspect of the self. Do you remember Stula Atma? Yesterday I mentioned. So, consciousness associated with the entire cosmos is called the gross aspect or physical aspect of God. Basically, the body of God, the entire universe. The technical term in Sanskrit is Virat. It literally means the vast. There are different names. Vaishwanara, Virat. In Gita you find Vishwarupa. Arjuna wanted to see this. He tells Krishna, I believe what you are telling me, that you are an incarnation of God and all this is fantastic, but uh, I would like to see it. You know, sort of, can I, can I get a, actually f see that? And Krishna says, yes. Arjuna very soon wished that he had not asked. <laughs> Krishna says, yes, I'm glad you asked. So, here goes. And there's an 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Some of the most awesome poetry you get in Sanskrit. A description of the cosmic form of God. Consciousness associated with the entire cosmos. Arjuna is frankly terrified. He is terrified. It blows his mind. Uh, it's like... He says, I see the entire world packed into you. It's like we are experiencing the universe in slices. One person at a time, one place at a time, one time at a time. Yeah. One body at a time, one life at a time. That's how you're experiencing it. Imagine if you were to experience the entire universe at one go. Straight away. They say, well, in public speaking, the problem is when people are staring at you, you tend to feel nervous. So... People are staring at you because they want to listen. So if the hundred people are staring at you, they, they, they call it, the, what do they call it? The, the podium nervousness or something like that. Stage, stage, stage fright. fright. Stage fright. They call it stage fright. Where, uh, coming on stage and people are looking at you and you feel you're going to forget your lines or things like that. That's because people are staring at you. In fact, one anthropologist said, it's a typical animal reaction. In the animal world, animals stare at each other um, f out of aggression. So, they, that's why when we look at each, when we talk to each other, we don't directly stare at a person. We look at and look away, then look back again. If you completely ignore, that is off-putting. If you directly, continuously stare at a person, <laughs> that's your boss mad at you. <laughs> now imagine an audience staring at you. Hundred people, a thousand people. The biggest one I have ever faced was 14,000 people in Belur Matindo. So, now that can be scary. Um, in fact, the scariest audience that I ever faced was our council of monks when it meets the monastic. Mm -hmm. 
So I was asked to speak. I was a young monk at that time, a freshly minted monk. <laughs> and I was asked to give a short talk to the, council, the gathered council. So imagine all your superiors, 400 or 500 monks sitting and staring at you in the audience. <laughs> And he's just nothing compared to them. And here you are going to speak to them. <laughs> so that was the most terrifying audience. But now Arjuna feels, imagine now, what would it be like? If you have 10 people staring at you, makes you uncomfortable. What would it be like if all 7 billion people on this planet suddenly turned and looked at you? <laughs> what would it be like that every little creature of the sky and the ocean and the land uh, all the lions and elephants and uh, 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 whales and all, they suddenly turned and looked and stared at you. Uh, not only at this time, but everybody who ever lived in the past, everybody who is going to live in the future, yeah. all of that coalesced into one tremendous form. And that form appears before Arjuna and then looks down at him. It's a the description. As if a thousand suns were to rise in the sky together. Yugapad Sahasra Divi Sahasra Suryeshu. A thousand suns blaze forth and the, 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 the brightness, the glare of that divine person is like that. This is a verse which was actually quoted by Oppenheimer when he first saw the atom bomb explosion. He was a scholar of the Gita. So he actually quoted, he said, I come, time, the destroyer of worlds. And he saw the first mushroom cloud. That is the conception of God. But that is just the beginning in the Mandukya Upanishad. That is the physical aspect of God. Just as this body is your physical aspect. Then you retreat into the world of mind. Imagine consciousness associated with one mind is you in your dream world. Consciousness associated with all our minds. It's like being in the internet which is hooked up to all computers. Imagine if you have access to every mind of all living beings, all living creatures, on every possible planet, in every possible t period of time, all instantaneously before you. That is called Hiranyagarbha, the cosmic mind. Consciousness associated with cosmic mind. That is the subtle aspect of God. And finally, the causal aspect of God. That is consciousness with the power of Maya, which projects all of this, this entire universe, and then absorbs it back again. So that is called Ishwara. God in Mandukya Upanishad, three names are given. Why are there three gods? No, no more than there are three yous. You are you are a waker, you are a dreamer, and you are a deep sleeper. Doesn't mean there are three of you. You alone are all three. So God alone is Virat, the cosmic god. God alone is the cosmic mind, Hiranyagarbha. God alone is Ishwara, the creator, preserver and destroyer of this universe. And omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, all loving, all good. All of this is the creation, the bounty of that one God. If you have not been carried away with the flow of rhetoric, if you are of a skeptical turn of mind, you might ask this question. I am a waker, dreamer and deep sleeper. It is constantly revealed through me, to me by my experience. And I can understand other people are also like that. But how do I know there is one consciousness associated with the entire universe? That is not known to me directly. Consciousness associated with individuals, I can see it in myself. And I can sort of understand for everybody. But one consciousness for everybody associated with everything, all bodies, all minds. How do I know that exists? Well, there you take a leap of faith. That is why God is not a demonstrated fact. But remember, from the Mandukya point of view, you, can, you need not take the God route. All you need to do is analyze yourself, your own experience, and you reach the Turiya. But that Turiya, that pure consciousness, is where you and God are one. I can only say, you know, it's not just an intuition of the Advaita philosophers. Great teachers like the the medieval Christian mystic, Meister Eckhart, when he says, the ground of my soul, what is the ground of my soul? Turiya. And the ground of God are one and the same. What is the ground of God? Turiya. The same consciousness. You are exactly identical with God, but only at, as Turiya. There, individual and total do not make a difference. There is no individual and total there. Now, oh, we are talking about Om. So how does Om relate to all of this? 
Ob is regarded as the perfect name for God. Why? A, uh, the first letter, A, uh, refers not only to you, the waker, and your waking universe, but also it refers to the cosmic waker and the, cos the entire cosmos. The letter U refers not only to you and your dream world, but also refers to the cosmic mind, consciousness with the all minds together. And the letter M refers not only to you in your deep sleep, but also to the cosmic sleeper. That's why in Indian uh, iconography, those miniature paintings, sometimes you will see Vishnu lying on his bed, the, the great serpent Sheshanaga, and sleeping. He looks like a couch potato. He's always sleeping. <laughs> but that is the causal state of God, Vishnu. So all of those, that is re represented by the letter M. And the, and the silence after um, represents Nirguna Brahman, the, the, the ultimate reality beyond all attributes and qualifications. So Om, remarkably, represents Saguna Brahman and Nirguna Brahman, God with all beneficent attributes and the absolute Godhead beyond all these attributes. The whole thing is represented by Om. The letters represent Saguna Brahman and the silence represents Nirguna Brahman. So it is again the perfect name for, uh, for God. Uh, in Upanishads, the terms used are Aparabrahma and Parabrahma. Aparabrahma is the relative Brahman, this uni expressed as this universe, physical universe, subtle universe, causal universe. And Parabrahma, the transcendent Brahman, as pure consciousness, existence consciousness place. And that thing is identical with you, your own inner reality. I think that sort of covers Om. <laughs> <laughs> we have over five minutes. Um, yeah, Mark, you take five minutes. I'll, yeah. I'll get things ready. Go ahead. Or can we have a rapid fire round of questions? <laughs> yes. This may just be stretching an analogy too far, but the uh, the idea that uh, our dreams are analogous to this level of yeah. reality, but our dreams, our personal dreams, are not contiguous. In other words, when we go to sleep yeah. tonight, but this is contiguous. Yes. If we're on a train and we fall asleep, we wake up, the train has traveled without our consciousness. Is yeah. there a spiritual significance uh, to see This that? is... So what he has said is sometimes taken as an, is put forward as an objection to conflating dream and waking. What Gaudapada does in Mandukya Upanishad, he conflates dream and waking. Um, I can relate it to the, what, the answer I gave to his question about Ajata Vada. You know the two approaches, Drishti Srishti Vada and Srishti Drishti Vada, universe has been created and we experience it. It's very much like the waking world. I experience the universe, therefore it exists, is very much like the dream world. And the two, there is some difference between the two. But Gaurapada insists there is no difference between the two. The what differences which seem to be there are inconsequential. I refer you to Swami Nikhilananda's uh, four-volume work on the Upanishads. In one of those volumes, where he discusses the Mandukya Upanishad, there is an appendix. There he raises ten objections to conflating dream and to, you know, to calling this world a dream. He says this, this, this is, uh, it violates our common sense. Uh, we clearly see the difference between dreams and waking. How can this life be, waking life also be a dream? And what are the objections? He gives ten objections. One of them is this, waking life is continuous, dreams are discontinuous. We come back to the same life. And then he cuts down those objections. At the end of those ten objections, where you are desperately trying to maintain the border between dreaming and waking, and he's kind of constantly fudging at the border, at the end of that, you feel very, very creepy, you know. That <laughs> this could as well, you feel what's real at the end of that. And what's real is you, the witnessing consciousness, not what you witness. Yes. Who's next? Yes. Somebody else. Uh, we'll go there next, yes. The subtle body functions or wakes up. Correct. And I Correct. get to, I don't know that the Manduka Upanishad uh, discusses how we can become aware during the waking state, for example, of how the subtle or the causal body is affecting us. Right. In fact, right now, you're not in the waking state. 
the, the gross aspect of the self, um, which is represented by a. Uh, it's not that only it's a body. You're not only a body here. You're also a mind, right? So the subtle body, the mind is a part of the subtle body. The subtle body is functioning. What happens in the waking state is there is the physical body, there is the subtle body and the causal body and of course you the consciousness. What happens in dream state is the physical body falls asleep, drops out of your experience. You have got the subtle body and the causal body and of course you the consciousness. What happens in dream state is the subtle body, the mind stops functioning. I will not say the subtle body stops functioning because prana is there. So mind stops functioning, goes to sleep. So there is only the causal body and you the consciousness. But you the consciousness are one and same all throughout. It is true, in the waking state we have all three, waking, dreaming and deep sleep. And why do you have to make a special effort? Are you not aware of the mind right now? When you sit quietly and watch thoughts, feelings, and when you are angry, that's a subtle body. When you are at peace, that's a subtle body. When you want something, that's a subtle body. That's not the physical body as such. Um, I'll come to you next. Think, uh, Can you speak a little loudly? Somehow it's not catching. Correct. So these are standard questions. Um, remember, the Mandukya did not say everything in the waking world is a projection of the mind. Everything in the dream world is a projection of the dreamer's mind, that we know. And everything in the waking world here is a projection through Maya from consciousness itself. Even the mind is a projection. The mind also appears in consciousness. Um, this is the distinction between Gaudapada and subjective idealism, say a Berkeleyan idealism. Bishop Berkeley was a well-known philosopher who said everything is the mind. Uh, so whatever we experience is the mind. That's a difficult position to refute, though it's not in fashion in the modern world anymore. But, but Gaudapada is not saying that. He says even mind is, a, is an appearance in consciousness. Because how do you prove that? Because it disappears in deep sleep. Consciousness remains. So, yes. Now your question was that um, how do we experience deep sleep if the mind is not functioning in deep sleep? Where is the memory and all, whatever, right. Now, the answer given in uh, Vedanta is, remember there is one more body, one more instrument. Other than the subtle body, there is the causal body. Causal body in Sanskrit is called Ajnana. So, a standard text of Advaita Vedanta, Vedanta Sar, answers this question di directly. How is the deep sleep experience, within quotes, how is it registered and how is it again recovered in, in, when you wake up and you say, I experience deep sleep. It says, Ati sukshma bhi agyana vritti bhi. By the very subtle movements of agyana. Now, deep sleep, agyana means ignorance. That's what we have in deep sleep. Uh, that's a portion, that's, a, that's a, a fraction of maya. It seems to be nothingless. But it's, it's a active, volatile nothingness. Because from that again comes waking and dream, uh, dream states. I was just reading. Completely unrelated to this, but very interesting. It's, I don't understand quantum mechanics, but I was just reading a book in which it says how this universe might have popped up out of a quantum flux. It seems to be nothing, but it's not really nothing. It's uh, um, a very, um, the, way, the phrase they used is, nothingness is unstable. <laughs> nothingness is unstable. <laughs> because it's not really nothingness. So, um, but like that, deep sleep is also not nothing. It is an entity capable of recording experiences. Uh, experiences of what? There are no experiences there. It's only itself, that absence. So that is recorded in itself. And that recording is not a subject-object recording. So when you recover the memory of deep... Memory is also within a quote. It's not really memory. Memory is in the subtle body. When you recover that experience, you never recover it as, I remember the experience of sleeping. You ate a pizza and you will recall that memory. You have the experience of... The memory is of the form, I remember eating the pizza and it tasted like this. But you never remember deep sleep in that way. I remember deep sleep and it felt like that. No. You just feel instinctively there was a period of nothingness. That is the recording. And it <coughs> comes from the Agyan. Even more precise if you want, Ananda Maya Kosha. The lady here. Can you give the microphone to the lady? Raise your hand. Yeah. 
we'll come to you. Very last question. Last question. Yeah. Pranam Swamiji, yes. you were, um, in the three states as you were talking, you mentioned the instant prana. So can you connect that and uh, the samadhi state and what, well, how exactly can you bring Icha Maranam into this? Oh, I will not try to answer that at all. Um, it, like, you know, the, the presence of prana is, um, is a sort of calculation from our part, from externally. We say the prana, the life forces must be there because otherwise in deep sleep, if you, the subtle body does not function at all, then the physical body also would die. So the prana must be working from our point of view. But from your point of view, the deep sleeper, you don't experience breathing or blood circulation or anything like that. You don't experience the physical body. You just experience blankness. Now there is a big difference between deep sleep and samadhi. There is a similarity because <coughs> samadhi is chitta vritti nirodha. The, the cessation of the movements of the mind. And deep sleep also the mind has ceased to move. But the difference is deep sleep is a tamasic state and samadhi is a sattvic state. They are not exactly the same. Uh, um, and as Vivekananda said, a fool goes into deep sleep and comes out a fool. And a fool goes into samadhi and comes out enlightened. By the way, I'll just, I'll just leave you with one uh, connecting link between all that we learnt and samadhi. I am leaving you with this, I think, because Swami Brahmananda wants me to say it. I was just reading, before coming here, I was reading, he gives a description of the stages. By this kind of analysis which we did, you can come to a conviction about who am I, what am I. That he calls bodhe bodhkara, and consciousness realizing itself through itself. There is no other way. And the mind does not realize it. You realize yourself through yourself. But then he says that's not the end. He says once you hit upon it, then if you use these techniques like the Om meditation, you become absorbed in that silence after a uh, ooh, mm. As you become absorbed in that silence, he says that leads to nirvikalpa samadhi. Yeah. So that leads and that stabilizes your realization. Once you come out of that Nirvikalpa Samadhi, you know forever without any doubt that you are not this physical body, subtle body or causal body. You are the immortal consciousness witness of all three. So that Samadhi also plays a role in deepening that understanding. But Jnani Yogis will always insist, Samadhi is not the main thing. The main thing is to first to get what they are talking about. And that we can get now itself. With prayers to Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, Swami Vivekananda, May we be blessed with this conviction, this understanding and the final realization in this very life. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu Very good. Thank you. So we have this impromptu Q&A session. Um, yes, there's a question there. Hold it to wait, your... Wait, wait for the microphone yeah. and put it next to your mouth. Is it open? Uh, is it on? Is it on? You don't hear it. Yes, um, the, let me uh, just <coughs> dilate a little bit on the question itself. He used the term Ajatavada, the, uh, but, but the mic is working, right? You can hear, hear me, it? this one? No, it is working, but is it turned on very low or something? Hello, yeah, you can hear it now, maybe it was, yeah. Yeah. No. But, but or right, let me speak. L low voice. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. No. Pe people in the back cannot hear me. No. So it's the mics are not working. Maybe. It, it, it's working. No, no. Is this Darcy? I don't hear this one. It's working. Checking. One, two, three. Can you yeah. hear me? It's not very loud. It's not Just increase the volume then. Yeah. So the master volume. Now, Yes, something is. 
sucking the life out of the <laughs> microphone. <laughs> yes. All right, as long as we can uh, hear each other. He used the term Ajatavada, which is a philosophically a difficult term, a very profound term, which, which is attributed to Gaudapada. Let me give you the context of this discussion. What does it mean, actually? This universe and Brahman, the Absolute, what is the relation between the two? So did Brahman create this universe? Um, or is this universe non-different from Brahman? Is it just an appearance? Or even more radically, is there no universe at all? That seems very radical because we see it. I can, um, I can understand if you say it was created by the Big Bang or by God or something. I can understand that. I can even understand if you say it's a dream. It's just like your dreams, you're dreaming this. That also I can understand in a matrix sort of way. But if you say it's not there at all, that's really difficult to swallow because I'm, that's all that I experience, this universe. And that's what Ajatavada is. Gaudapada is saying there is no universe at all. So how are we to understand this? In Advaita Vedanta, there are these three approaches to non-duality. One is called Shrishti Drishti Vada. The second one is, I'll explain. The second one is called Drishti Shrishti Vada. And the third one, the most profound, most radical, most difficult to comprehend is called Ajata Vada. So you don't go with the easy questions, right? You <laughs> always start with the difficult questions. So what, if you move step by step, you'll understand where this is going. The first one, Srishti Drishti Vada is, is basically a common sense view, our view of the universe. You know, what do we feel? The universe exists. The world exists. Definitely my parents exist and, the, and, and the, this, uh, this samsara exists and I have been born into it. Right? When I was born, already this universe was there. It's not that me experiencing it creates the universe in any, any way. Subjectively, I, co I contribute a component of it in my experience, but otherwise this universe is a given for me. And I come into an already existing universe. There's a common sense view. What might be called realism. And if you accept this view, that's what we normally, that's how we begin. Ad Advaita, non-dualism can be taught in this way also. Most of the non-dualistic texts start, start with this worldview. Literally the Sanskrit means Srishti, Drishti, Vada. Srishti means creation or projection. The world is, universe is first created. Drishti is then you see it, then you experience it. That's how we feel. That's normally what we feel about our lives. There's a world and we are experiencing a world. In contrast to this, is the second view, a deeper and more, more uh, sophisticated, more subtle view, is that the world exists in our experience, not apart from our experience. The very term Drishti Srishti Vada means your experiencing is that which creates the world. A good example is, is come, don't worry, we have not started. We are just doing uh, have an just informal discussion, <laughs> yes. A good example is our dreams. In our dreams, the people you meet, the places you visit, the things that you're seeing, all those things which you experience in the dream are, uh, come, don't worry, we have not started, just informally talking. They are there, there because you're dreaming it. Are, are you with me? If you do not dream, suppose you snap out of dream, you are eating a pizza in your dream. And then you say, oh, it's time to wake up, the alarm clock is ringing, now I'll put the pizza in the dream kitchen, in the dream fridge, refrigerator, and uh, tomorrow when I dream, I'll come back and eat the rest of the pizza. You can't do that. The moment you wake up from the dream, the pizza is gone, the, dream, uh, the kitchen is gone, the refrigerator, all of it is gone. Why? Because it does not exist apart from your dreaming. Right so far? Imagine if the world, the waking world were like that. It does not exist apart from the experiencing consciousness. That is called Drishti Shrishti Vada. Drishti Shrishti Vada in uh, Sanskrit, the English would mean, Drishti means seeing or experiencing, and Shrishti means creation. Your world is not apart from your 
experiencing or creation. Come, sit. I will. Yes. <laughs> And the third view is there is no universe at all. That is the Ajatavada. And Gaurapada uses the example of space, space itself, and the space within a pot. So space within a pot would, would mean the sentient being us, and space itself is Brahman. But there, there is really no difference between the space within the pot and, and space itself. What do you mean by that? It just seems to be demarcated. The pot seems to cut off a certain amount of space and say that this, this space is inside the pot. Actually, space is not inside the pot. It's the pot inside the space. How do you prove that? What does it mean for something to be contained in a pot? Or say a glass of a glass. If you put water in the glass, if I move the glass from here to there, will the water move with it? You don't seem very confident. <laughs> You're going to you're going to make yes. You're going to make a very very wet mess if if you if the water stays there and take the glass away. The, the water will move with it. And the water is contained in the glass. Now, if it's an empty glass, so there is space outside the glass and space inside the glass. If I move the glass through space like this, is the space inside the glass moving with it? No. 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 It is not. It is rather the glass moving through space. Space does not move through, through the glass, or with the glass. Space is not in any way affected by the presence of the glass. So, it is not that the space is contained within the glass. The presence of the glass doesn't make any, any difference to space. Like that, if you think of existence, consciousness, bliss, isness, awareness, which you are, the, the fourth turiya, which we spoke about yesterday, Bodies and minds and the universe make no difference to it at all. You are always one with, with Brahman. The presence of the body does not mean that you are somehow contained in this body. Rather, the body appears and moves around in you, the awareness. Just like you are like space and the body is like a pot. But it gives the impression of making you embodied. You feel that you are within this body. But rather... From the point of view of consciousness, the body is within you. Can you think of it that way? The entire world of dreams that you experience, is it not in a sense within you? It's not out there anywhere. It's all here. That's an example. In the same way, right now, can you see in one sense, instead of thinking, here I am somehow within this body, and this body is within this room, and this room is within a vast universe. Instead of thinking about that, can you look at it this way? I am aware of the body, I am aware of this room, I am aware of this universe. So in one sense the universe, body, mind, all of it is in my awareness. Just like a dream. Yeah. They are not anything apart from this awareness. Because they have no existence apart from this awareness. Come. You cannot say that the universe is something other than your awareness. There is no such thing called a universe other than awareness. We'll talk a little more about it today when I speak about Om. That non-existence of the universe, apart from your awareness, that is called Ajatavada, the, the doctrine, the great teaching of non-origination. Most profound, very difficult to understand. How can you actually ex experience a universe and yourself in this universe and say it does not exist. In, a good example is of course the dream. Where if you suppose you could lucid dreaming, you could be in the dream and experiencing people and experiencing yourself and at the same time if you were aware it's a dream, you could truthfully affirm it is not there. Then what is there? I myself the dreamer. In that sense. Questions? Alright then, uh, let's, at this point let's just get a song. All right. We can have an opening song and then we'll have you do your, your lecture. Okay? All right.
What, what, no, okay, uh, let me just take uh, yeah. What is the Turiya? Turiya, that is beyond the Turiya. Ah, yes. Um, I'll just mention a, a, a couple of lines here. Uh, remember, this. Um, I mentioned yesterday the classic mistake many people make. That there is some fourth thing called Turiya. Apart from waking, dreaming and deep sleep. It is in and through the waking and dreaming and deep sleep. Gold is not a new kind of ornament. Gold is the reality of all the golden ornaments. Similarly, Turi is the reality of the first three. It's not a fourth thing apart from the first three. <coughs> now, so sometimes people think that there is something called Turiya and Turiya Tita, beyond the Turiya. They have made, and these terms are available in the Shastras. And there is a certain reason why the terms are used. From an experiential point of view, for a seeker, you might get an intuition of the Turiya. We are, right now, for example, hopefully you are beginning to understand what the Turiya is. Then you might, it might become very real for you. Then you might become established in it. Then it might become the only reality beyond the first three. The first three are jettisoned. Waking, dreaming and deep sleep, you realize all of it is nothing but Turiya. Then maybe you can call it, that, that stage you can call it Turiya Atita. So experientially, from the point of view of the spiritual seeker, different points may be indicated by calling it the Turiya, Turiya Atita, things like that. But philosophically, no, these are not valid. That's why you'll see never in the Upanishad or in the Mandukya Karika or in Shankara Bhashya, never speak of things like Turiya Atita. <coughs>